You know, we as people of God desire growth, don't we? I mean, we come to Jesus and we turn our lives over to Him and we're immersed in the baptistry. But then from that point forward, Scripture tells us we go through the sanctification process, the process of being made holy, becoming more like Jesus. And, and Scripture tells us that not only is it a promise that this can happen, there's an expectation that we become more and more like Jesus. But we know for this to happen that we've got to do this. We've got to die to ourselves so that we can live like Christ. And so we start wrestling with this, and we say, yeah, I, I know I need to do that, but how, how do you go about that process? Well, we're in the third week of a kind of mini-series on spiritual disciplines, looking at spiritual disciplines as, as a tool or a means to bring about this dying to self, so we become more and more like Jesus. And the, the idea is, if we practice and, and train like Jesus did for spiritual warfare, then we'll become more and more like Jesus. So that's the idea. Well, before we get started, I, I want us to begin with an illustration as we start talking about this. Now, this isn't new to me, uh, and perhaps some of you guys have, have seen this in the past, and I watched a, a, a video that Andy Stanley put out where he used this illustration. I thought it was very effective. So I want us to, to think about time in this way, that time is a vessel. And, and so this time could be a day, it could be a week, it could be a month, it, it could be a year, maybe a season of your life, or uh, perhaps the entirety of your life. Okay, so th this is the vessel of time. Well, what are these pebbles inside of here? Well, these are all the things that we really enjoy doing that waste our time. You know what I mean? And they, these are the things that uh, are kind of the spice of life that we really don't want to give up, but yet they do waste our time. And so you think about this, and well, what would that be in my life? For, well, for some of you, over 50% of the pebbles in your jar is Facebook, right? Yeah, you know who you are. I, I can see a few of you out there. It is, it's Facebook. And, and for others, it's online shopping. That's, that's what you choose to do. Some is surfing the, the Internet. Some is playing an extra round of golf or hanging out late with, with your friends. That's kind of your indulgence. For others, it's hours on end uh, playing on your smartphone. And for some, you watch a ton of, of television every night. So these are the things that are kind of non-crucial, but we enjoy doing, and we really don't want to give them up. But if we're honest, the things that are here, these small pebbles, are not crucial to our success, right? But we just enjoy them. We don't want to give them up. Okay, well, so we add to it the things that truly are crucial and, and important in our life. And these are kind of the big rocks. So if you're a parent, you know, you want to add in your kids and spend time with them, right? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. And, uh, you know, this bigger rock, that's your spouse. Or maybe you want a smaller rock, your spouse. But, okay, so we'll, we'll put that in there. Uh, and then you've got uh, time at, at work and, and certainly going on business trips and, and going to the office and doing all these different things. And if you're a student, well, there's time that you spend at school and, and doing homework and, and that type thing. Uh, and then, wow, uh, maybe it's, it's going to, to church and all the activities there with your small group and with uh, being involved in the ministry and going to Bible class. It, it, oh, and then you've got your relationship with God and your intimacy and, and time with Him. And you're, you're trying to fit all this in. And doesn't this kind of look like us? And we're like, we know these things are important, but it's hard to fit them in. And so what we'd really like to do is have a larger vessel of time. You know, how, how many of you say, boy, if I just had a few more hours in the day, okay? Well, I, I got a, a letter this week, and I'll pull it out here so you can see it. This is from uh, a guy that I'm kind of corresponding with and, and working to disciple, and he's on old school and, and likes to write. And so I was asking him about his discipleship and some of the things I was asking him to do. And so he kind of writes and, and shares in his letter all the things that are keeping him from spending time with God. You know, the thing he wants to do. Here's what he says. I continue to stay unbelievably busy. It seems I have a stack of work to do every day. And then there's all the painting I need to get done before September. I'm really not a good multitasker. 
Anyway, you add in church activities. Went to a revival two weeks ago. Lots to do. And all these things keep me from pursuing Jesus that I know will help me with my problems and set me free. Isn't, isn't that great? He, he kind of confesses that going and doing church activities are keeping him from pursuing Jesus. But that's a different sermon. For, but can, can, can you relate with this thing? What I didn't tell you is this pen pal of mine is in prison. He's in prison. He's got all the time in the world, but yet his schedule is so full, he can't fit in Jesus. And so this becomes our life. And so we start saying, how do we do this? Well, if we know that we can't fit any more in, and we, we, can't, uh, well, we can't add more time, perhaps there's another way of looking at it. What if we were to take the big rocks and put them in first? Okay? And start looking at some of this. And say, we're, we're going to focus on our time with God, and well, we're going to spend time at work and spend time doing our leisure activities and doing time with our spouse and doing all this wonderful different things and putting these in. What Andy Stanley says on this video is that our priorities determine our capacity. That priorities will determine how much we can fit into our life. And so if we start with these big rocks and give them the attention they need, it's not that we're going to neglect this. It's that we're putting this forward. And so whether it's a day, or whether it's a week, a month, or a life, we've got this amount of time, we put these big rocks in first. Okay, here's where it gets interesting. We still got all these things that we don't want to give up, right? The, the, the spice of life, the things that we enjoy doing. So we're, we'll add it in. Facebook, 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 okay. Online shopping, going out golfing, playing Fruit Ninjas, cut the rope, okay, all these different things, going out, spend time with friends, and watching Duck Dynasty. Okay, so we got these things. It gets better. If you look, there's room to spare. There's room to spare because priorities determine our capacity for life. And the sooner we start realizing this and, and understanding putting the big rocks in first, the more we can put into our life. Jill accuses me sometimes on, on vacation of trying to cram too much in. We're, and she says, we need a vacation for our vacation. But really, the the capacity for our lives is determined by the priorities. Well, for most of you guys that have seen this done before or have, have heard this, this isn't new information, is it? Then why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we putting this focus on the bigger rocks? Why aren't we putting those in first into our life? Why aren't we trying to get the most out of life by ensuring that the things that we say are, are most important to us go in first? Well, I think for a lot of us, we need to sit down and ask the question, what exactly are the big rocks in my life? What's most important to me? What are the non-negotiables? At the end of my life, that if, if I look back and, and say, well, I wasn't able to do this, this, and this on my bucket list, but I was able to do this. It, it wasn't added in. It wasn't trying to cram on top. I made sure that I covered this. That becomes our big rocks. Chances are there's room for all those things that you'd like to do and then we enjoy doing if we'll prioritize our day, our week, our month, and our lifetime. We think about these things. So there's room, and it's easy to put the small pebbles first. It is. And, and, and really, we live in, in a world that values these small pebbles that says, go for as much of this as you can. And, and, and they're easier sometimes in pursuing some of the big rocks. And so it's easier to, to watch all a sports center than it is to, to just watch for a few minutes and then pick up your Bible, spend time with God's Word. So these are some things that, that we wrestle with. But if we're not careful, we'll look back on seasons of our life after we kind of take a, take a, a breath and say, okay, we've gone through 10 years of marriage, or our, our kids are, are now this age and moving into middle school, and, and we have regrets sometimes when we say where did the time go it's not just what's most important it's who's most important in our life who are these these relationships that we say are important because sometimes when we add 
things that are even good into our life, the more we add, add, and add, well, sometimes these big rocks, these relationships are take a toll. And what we choose to do is we economize these relationships, doing just the bare minimum to get by with, with our parents or with our children or with those that we care about. In this case, inevitably, we'll look back with regret. I had the opportunity several months ago to officiate at a wedding. I was talking with the father of the bride backstage, and we're, we're getting ready, and they're, they're come playing some different music. He's about to go, uh, go with his daughter to walk down the aisles. So we're kind of talking. We said a little prayer uh, you know, beforehand, and we're talking. He says, you know, I look back over the time that I've had with her, he goes, I missed a lot of dinners. And I missed a lot of ball games. And he said, sometimes it was work, sometimes it was doing other things. He goes, I wish I could go back and recapture some of this time. I, I wish I could roll the clock back. I wish I had some more time with her, but I know I can't. I was talking with another father at graduation time, and he said, man, these 18 years just flew by. We had so many good intentions as a family to go and, and do some, some things together, to, to take those big vacations. We just never got around to it. So you just hear the, the regret in these two fathers' voices. And of course, our biggest rock is our time with God. And you talk with people about how much time that, that they felt like they've missed out following God and getting to know Him. And I'm sure in, in the past two weeks, as we've, we've listened to Larry and Lynn Hartzell and, and Tom Brown share about their, their time with prayer and I also had Rob Hanley talk about the, the hour that he spent each day in, in the month of May in, in solitude with God. You're sitting there going, I, I, I kind of want that. I, I want that intimacy that they're describing, and I'm almost jealous of it. But I can't fit what I'm doing right now into the 24 hours I'm given. How am I going to add in these spiritual disciplines of, of prayer and solitude? And so what would it look like in your life if you were to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to do something different. I, I'm, I'm going to try to prioritize above all other things. Well, what would have to change? Well, I, I'm going to go home today, and I'm going to tell my husband, and I'm going to tell my, my kids that I'm going to do better. I'm not going to volunteer for anything else. That it's, I'm just going to spend time with God and with them. That's going to be my priority. The only problem is we've talked about, that we've heard this lesson before, that has been explained to us about the importance of priorities. And sometimes we'll try for a little bit better, to be a little bit better, and then we kind of revert back into our old ways of doing things, don't we? What if, if things are going to be different this time, we try something a little different? Instead of just trying, what if we trained to put these priorities? What if our lives looked like this, just for a season? And this may be a couple of days, maybe a week, maybe a month. A way of, of looking at life where we strip away all these things that steal our time to just focus on the things that are of most importance. Well, our, our small group took a look at a book by Jen Hatmaker entitled Seven, An Experimental Mutiny Against Excess. And what Hatmaker goes in, and we'll talk about this book later on in the summer, and she looks at different aspects of their life, and one of the aspects that she targeted was entertainment. And she talks about the, the different things in, in their family that have robbed them of the intimacy that they really had. So she starts looking at doing the inventory, walking around their house, and this is what she discovered. She says, I walked around the house, I saw four gaming systems, two MacBooks and one desktop computer, five TVs, three cell phones, a DVR, two DVD players, three Nintendo DSs, and three stereos. And she said, what was amazing to me as I'm doing this inventory is it all happened in a relatively short period of time. She said they didn't have cable or an internet address before um, 2005. And here's what she says. I don't know what happened. We hedged on the boundaries one careless degree at a time, and now I can hardly recognize our family rhythm. So we have little screen worlds to immerse in. Actual human contact seems optional. Have you been there? Does this describe you and your spouse or you and your family? I mean, I've gone to a restaurant and see a, a couple, and they're both just sitting there doing this, not talking with each other at all. You're like, 
why, why not just go get drive through? You know, why are you spending time supposed to be interacting with each other? And who knows, they, they may be fighting, texting each other back and forth. But yeah, and, and, and so we, we go through this. And so what she ended up doing, she said, we're going to shut it all down for a month. And she, she shut down what she calls her seven screens. And this is what they are. For a month, their family is going to have no TV, no gaming, no Facebook or Twitter, no iPhone apps, no radio, no texting or internet for one whole month. Can you imagine your life? Well, I, I told you a few weeks ago that our group wasn't just going to study some of these things and talk about it. We're actually going to do it. So Tracy Stewart, come on up. Tracy reluctantly agreed to take this one on, to do a media fast for the entire month of May. So I'm going to turn this over to, to Tracy. She had a seat. Just share just a little bit about what you did first off and, and how it kind of impacted you and impacted your family and some things that you had to do during your media fast. Okay. Um, can I say you've already stepped on my toes oh, sorry. <laughs> this morning? <laughs> um, for the month of May, I these were my rules. Um, I went without radio, um, no TV, DVDs, movies, um, no internet, no Facebook, no blogs, no websites. Um, I used my cell phone only for calls, no Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, games like Candy Crush. And I no know. Pinterest too? Oh nope, my no. goodness. How are you going to plan your daughter's wedding in the future? Anyway, go, go ahead. Go ahead. I know. Um, and no texting. That was really hard. Yes. Um, and no, we are video games with the kids, which doesn't sound like a big deal, but I like to play games with my kids. Yes. <laughs> um, the, um, there was a few exceptions. I'm talking really loud. Um, I could check my email. Um, of course, in the month of May, I was still in school, so I had to check my work email. And I also checked my personal email. Um, I texted if it was like a time saver um, or if it was necessary. And there are a few times that I texted and I would preface it with, this is necessary. Um, <laughs> and I did allow myself to listen to some Christian CDs. Um, I think I, there was about five or six in my car for the whole month because um, I just couldn't go the whole month without music. Okay. All right. So those so, were the rules. So that's kind of your experience. Mm -hmm. And out of those different things, which one was the most difficult? Because I know that you and Ada are close, and y'all mm -hmm. would spend time doing little texts and also email yes. and stuff, and all that kind of got cut off. Because y'all have to actually connect, reconnect at, at small group and talk about what's going on in your week because you weren't giving every well, five minutes new updates. Um, we didn't text each other, but I will be honest. She and I emailed once a day. Okay. And... Um, once a day. I think once I did twice, and it was funny because as I was typing it, I was like, oh, I'm breaking my rule. Oh, well. <laughs> but, um, um, but that was really good because um, we talked a lot about how I was feeling that month, and we would share our quiet time with each other every day in our emails. Um, so that was, that was really good. But, but I did miss the texting because I love to text, and not just her, but a lot of people. <laughs> so that was kind of hard not to check my phone all the time. Um, but not to just send a quick, you know, a quick text. Okay. So that texting and face. I'm going to say texting and Facebook were the hardest. Okay. Now, you know, we have uh, close to 20 people were in the room, and no one wanted this because everyone thought that this would be very difficult. And now the ones that, that I experienced with you guys, this was very hard for me as well. But share just a little bit about your experience, what you, uh, you're, you're doing these things, but what started happening over the month? Well, um, I'm going to start with the negative. <laughs> okay. Um, there, there were days that I was, like, angry about doing this. Like, I, um, I, here's. Were you angry with yourself or angry with me? <laughs> I never thought about you. Oh, good. <laughs> um, no, I felt like I was, like, grounded or something. Like, okay. I felt like a teenager. Um, here's an excerpt from an email that I actually wrote to Ada. I said, I'm so over this media fast. Don't get me wrong, I'm not going to quit, but now I'm just like mad. I don't want to do it anymore. I feel like I've learned my lesson, though I'm sure even through this bad attitude I have more to learn. I don't even want to go back to the way things were, but I do want to relax and watch a show or read one of my blogs, something. So that was, there were difficult days. Um, okay, now no one's wanting to do this. So no, I know, it's going to be better. Tell some of the good things that came out of it. <laughs> Did you want me to make it all roses? No, no. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so um, then there were days that were pretty easy. Um, like I was, in, you know, I was in school teaching, so you know, throughout the day was fine. And then, you know, if I had after school chorus or if Eli had baseball, you know, you keep busy. It's yep. real easy. Um, the last week of May, school was out, and that was a little, a little bit harder. Um, but there were days that, it, I mean, it, you know, just went by and it was fine. It was just, um, but by the end of the month, um, I was really proud that I had made it through the month. And it was not perfect. Um, I think I watched an episode of Duck Dynasty. Well, that's, you get partial credit for it that. It was the finale. Okay, so. yes. Um, and I think I watched two episodes of Wipeout with my kids. That okay. doesn't count. Yeah, it's, it's educational. <laughs> All right, but Tracy, in, in the book, Jen mentions that her, her family, since they pulled out some of this, uh, ended up without electronics. They got into an alternative rhythm mm -hmm. that they started spending time out on the porch talking with neighbors. They also found that they liked to cook together as a family. One of her sons got into fishing. But he had never done that before, but during that month, he, he started filling his time with that. They also went on family walks after dinner. And so she says some of the things they pulled out were replaced with some good stuff. What was kind of your alternate rhythm that you were able to fill this time with? Um, well, what was different between uh, myself and Jen was that her whole family did it, and my family did not do it. <laughs> it was just me. So um, as far as the, like, the family's concerned, it wasn't a lot different, although at night, uh, kind of our night routine changed some because most of the time the kids get ready for bed and then we'll sit on the couch and watch TV for a little bit before they go to bed. And there were a few nights that they went ahead and did that without me, and I That's went so upstairs. Rude. I know. I know. But um, there were nights that we played um, games like Skippo and Yahtzee uh -huh. and, and um, did some of that. So that kind of changed a little bit. Um, for me personally, I read a lot more. I love to read anyway, but um, I almost felt like I changed one addiction for another <laughs> as far yeah. as that because um, I just I read a lot. Um, How did it help you in your, your growing relationship with God? Yes. Um, it seemed like I, I sought him out more in the like mundane, everyday activities. Um, the very first morning, May 1st, I woke up, and uh, usually in the morning, like, I would um, fix breakfast for the kids before I went and woke them up, and I would have a few minutes to check my phone, check Facebook and Instagram and all that, and so I had gotten the kids ready, or their breakfast ready, and I was standing there, and I had, like, 10 minutes before I needed to wake them up, and I was like, what am I going to do? And so <laughs> I thought, I'm going to pray to God. Good. And then I was just like, how pitiful is that? That was my last, like, thought, you know? And, I mean, I pray. I pray, but, you know, that was just a time that I didn't usually pray. Um, and then there was another time a few days later, um, I was doing the laundry, and I was kind of aggravated because usually when I fold laundry, I watch TV or listen to the radio, and I couldn't do either one of those things. Um, so I decided to pray again. So as I was folding um, socks and underwear, I decided to pray for whosoever it was as I was folding right. it. And um, just thanking God for my family and their health and, and even the fact that we had so many socks and underwear to be fo folded. Go. But um, I wanted to read, a, is it okay if I read a little yeah, bit from her book? Sure. Because um, this, this is kind of how I felt about it. She put it in good words. She says, um, God hasn't made a nuisance of himself or given tasks for my newfound time. He's just been extra there. Sort of like, remember I'm here with you all the time and I can help you choose kindness and patience during the day. And she says, I'm not transferring this extra time to hardcore Bible study. This is something different, something more relational and daily, something in the gaps of spiritual activities in between the stuff on a calendar. It's just simple communion, the natural kind people, uh, between people who spend a lot of time together. So is that so, what you experienced? Mm -hmm. just That's what I found. God like in, in the downtime, in the downtime instead of, because, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of few extra minutes in the day, but, yes. you know. And I think we wasted, I wasted a lot on my phone, especially. Um, and so to just think about, you know, God's there, you know, and um, communing with him, like she said, just natural communion. Okay, now you've entered back into the electronic world. Has, did you go right back up to the same levels, or were you able to learn from this? Um, I think, I think right away I went back to the same levels I think and then I got to thinking about it and I, I wrote a blog post about it and it really got me thinking um, 
and I want to even pull back even more. Um, I don't think I'm right. I don't, I don't think I'm to the same level. I asked my family, and my kids said no, and my husband said, hmm. So. But is this something you'd recommend? <laughs> Absolutely. And yes. Can I, can I read a little, another sure. little piece? I'm sorry. Um, this is what I feel like was my like, ultimate lesson from the, from the month, because um, I, I didn't know if I was just going to you know, learn some little lessons along the way, or if you know, God was just going to like smack me in the forehead with a lesson. And um, through the month of May, I also decided to read um, a Proverbs a day, a chapter from Proverbs a day. And um, so I wrote about what I learned from that. It says, um, by the end of the month, I convinced myself that I didn't really have a problem with media at all. And would this month just hurry up and be over so that I can get on with my Facebooking, Instagramming, Pinteresting, blog reading, texting, radio blaring, TV showing, show watching life already. Then I read Proverbs 25, and the last verse totally knocked me over. It reads, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. This was my lesson for the month. This is what God wanted to teach me. I was getting to the point where I was really frustrated because I felt like I wasn't doing anything bad with media, so why was I even doing this fast anyways? And I was ready to be done. God showed me that, yes, I was using media for good things, like texting encouragement, listening to Christian radio, um, not watching bad stuff on TV, etc. But what I really needed to open my eyes to was how much time I was spending on it and how it was taking away from my family. That part of it was out of control. And a broken down city without walls is a city that allows anything to come in and take over. I need to have discipline and I need to be wiser about using that discipline for how much time I spend on media before my walls are broken down and I allow anything in. Not only because of the time spent on it, but good things can quickly turn to bad. So for me, it was, it was a matter of just the amount of time. And in the end, I, I don't ever want my husband and my kids to think that I, I think that my phone is more important than them. Yeah. And I think it was getting to that point. Yeah. So, Tracy, our appreciation. Thank you very much. <laughs> you know, foregoing media, though not a traditional practice, um, would fall into the disciplines of abstinence because it, it requires restraint and sometimes called a, a discipline of omission. Sometimes something that's being removed from our lives. But it, it's the idea that it's not just to remove something from our life as it ends into itself. We've got to replace that, as Tracy talked with, about allowing God to fill in some of that time. If you remember the, the parable of the strong man who realizes he has a, an evil spirit that, that has taken over and he decides he's going to cast that spirit out, and while the spirit has been thrown out, he cleans the house from top to bottom and, and sweeps the house uh, till it is spick and span. But the evil spirit comes back with seven spirits worse because it hasn't been filled with something good. And that's what happens. So disciplines of abstinence like fasting and simplistic living and, and chastity get paired with disciplines of engagement, Bible study, prayer, and worship and service. So removing things that distract us, what it allows us to do is it creates time. It also creates energy, and it creates room for a deeper, lasting, and intimate relationship with God. I know it's kind of a simplistic way of thinking about it, but just think of it that maybe foregoing a game of words with friends will allow you time for words with God. Just kind of a, a new way of thinking about things. How would you rearrange your day? How would you rearrange your schedule? How would you make sure that your priorities that you state they're important make their way in to what you're doing is most important? Well, Scripture tells us that God is that big rock. If you remember at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, how does he end the lesson? He says, you've got to do these things. You've got to put them into practice because the one that does is building his life upon the rock, the foundation. And that's our Heavenly Father. Certainly David seems to be saying the same things in Psalms 18 and verse 31. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? He's like, I'm looking at my life. There's a lot of things going on in my kingdom. But God, he's the foundation. He's the rock. He's my stronghold that I grab a hold of. 
Well, if we make that analogy, and if we say he's our rock, he's what's most important, then our life should be ordered according to that. Now, Scripture doesn't talk a lot about priorities. What it talks about is what we seek after, what we're pursuing. And if God's the end-all, be-all, He's the big rock that we're building our life around, we've got to seek after Him. Psalm 61, uh, 63 and verse 1 says, Oh God, You are my God. Earnestly I seek You. My soul thirsts for You. My body longs for You in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Is that how you describe your relationship with God right now? Are you hungering and, and thirsting for Him? Wanting this big rock to go in first into your container of time. Psalms 119.10 says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. See, if the big rock goes in first, we put that in, well then it starts ordering the other rocks around it. And it starts making it to where our life is centered around the precepts and the laws of God. To where it just seems to make sense. And so it becomes an organizing principle for everything in our lives. And then that starts spilling into our other relationships and the things that we do. So we see that our marriage takes on a God perspective. The way we parent our kids is an overflow of our time with God. How we work. Scripture talks about how work is a blessing. A blessing from God. But we're not working for a, a man or a person. We're working for our Heavenly Father. See how this big rock then overflows into everything else that we're doing. So suddenly God in his ways, not shopping at your DVR queued, that everything's going, begin to order your life. So two things that we need to, to really get past before we can put this into practice. Number two, these pebbles, the things that I, I, I think are, are, are so important, the things I do are not value neutral. Tracy kind of filled in the rest of my sermon for and what she was talking about and the realization she came through in the rest of the month. These things, just because I'm not watching bad things on television, they're still time-consuming. Just because I'm, I'm texting a friend and encouraging them, don't think that if it goes on and on and it becomes out of balance, that is not going to hurt us. Keeping up with old friends on, on Facebook. You know, besides, these things help me unwind and relax, and I enjoy them. Well, in moderation, all of it is true. But when these things come between your time with God, then as Rich Mullins penned, the stuff of earth competes with the allegiance that I hold for my king. So the, the thing that I should be putting up is no longer Jesus, but these things that we label as value neutral. The second thing we need to get our arms and our mind around is the things I need to do can wait. I, I know these are big rocks, and I'll get to them at some point. I, I, I know that I need to spend some more time, and I need to build and strengthen up my marriage, but Rome was built in a day, and, and neither is a marriage, so I'll, I'll get to that. That conversation that I should be having with my daughter, that will come someday. And so the, man, our, our time with God, when, when my life settles down a little bit, that's when I'll spend more time with my Heavenly Father. And so when things are a little less hectic, but Psalms 90 and verse 12 says this, teach us to number our days all right, and we may gain a heart of wisdom. Two suggestions, two take-homes for me, and I'm going to challenge you to actually do this. Number one, I'm going to encourage you to detach. Choose an activity. Choose an indulgement, a, a, a distraction that you're willing to forego. Now, let me just tell you, you've got to choose one that's a big deal to you. If you get on and check your Facebook once a month and post every six months, giving up Facebook is not a sacrifice. Pick the thing that you really enjoy doing. And if it's Fruit Ninjas, choose that. But pick one activity, or you can pick multiple. If you want to do this and go, go whole hog, man, blessings to you. But pick out something that you're willing to forego. Maybe it's for a day, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month. You'll be surprised the impulses that you get to do that. Your mind automatically does that. This week I did media fast to, to get ready for this with, with Tracy. And I had to remove the faceplate from my radio in my truck. 
it, I had to detach it and put it in a pocket because every time I got in the car, I did this. Every time I got off the phone, even though I'd already done this when I got in the car, when I would hang up my phone after talking with Jill, I'd go to turn the radio back up. So I had to take the, the faceplate off because your brain constantly is sending you information to do this activity. And so you catch yourself, take a step back and say, okay, God, I'm not doing that. Let's talk. And so I encourage you to pick an activity. Richard Foster in his Celebration of Discipline says that when we detach from the confusion of the world around us, it allows us to have a richer attachment to God. So choose an activity, choose a duration, and give it up to God. So after we detach from the world, it allows us to, number two, attach to God. Spend time, spend that time engaging with the big rocks in life. If God is that big rock and we declare he is our end all and be all, he is the creator of heavens and earth, get up in the morning and tell him that. Start your day off with a prayer saying, God, you are my big rock. And I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging that. Now let that affect every, everything else going on in my life. Let, me, let that pour out into my life. Lord, help me to, to order my entire world around the fact that you are God. So maybe you need to, to turn off the TV at night, go for a walk with your son or daughter and have a talk. Maybe you need to tell the, the guys that you play golf with three or four times a week, I, I'm going to take Friday off, find someone else to, for the foursome, and I'm going to take my wife to brunch. Maybe it's, it's taken not spending quite as much time at the office and you're going to start your day at the office spending time with God. Whatever it is, I encourage you to detach from the world that we built around us that just doesn't make sense and attach to God. This morning we want to offer an invitation because becoming like Jesus means discipleship. And discipleship is a call to discipline. And true freedom comes when life's appetites are tuned in with God instead of the ways of building our own kingdom. Where is your life focus? Is it spent with thoughts of God and His ways, the things that are important to Him? Or are you spending your days, your weeks, your months, your years, or your lifetime consumed with the stuff of this earth? I encourage you to make that big rock your Heavenly Father Maybe this morning you want to put him on in baptism, make that declaration. Maybe it's that you need to come here and come down front in front of your brothers and sisters and just say, I want to declare once and for all, God is my end all, be all, and my life is going to start looking like it. Maybe it's a, a time of confession when you come and say, because I have had my, my life not in balance, not focused on that, there's been some relationships that have suffered. Whatever it is, I encourage you to make a stand today. Come forward, share with the Lord how important he is. Make sure he is the big rock in your life. We can help you this morning. Come now as you stand, as we sing. Praise him, you heavens and all that.